Yeah. Well, my name is Keila Knox, right? And I'm security engagement manager for ADA Cybersecurity. And I know a lot of you guys may not even know what that means, but for the most part, I operate um, as like a project manager for our security team. If I'm not actively doing the engagements, doing the pen testing, social engineering, so forth, I pretty much oversee and manage most of those projects. Um, and kind of like what this talk is stemming from, like, so I have a QR code. If anyone wants to connect with me, come move this way a little bit. I like the minute right if anyone wants to connect with me, phone number, LinkedIn, social platforms, you name it, you're welcome to scan this QR code. I know this is a cybersecurity conference, so you don't have to be weary about any malicious code going to your phone and stuff like that. I promise you, I, I won't do that to you. <laughs> um, so, this talk is going to be about mental health and staying sane and silent. Um, it stemmed from a conversation I had with one of my engineers. Can anyone hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sweet. It stemmed from a conversation I had with one of my engineers. Uh, he does a lot of hard forensic uh, work. And him and my boss got into like a real deep, intimate conversation about some of the work that they were doing and seeing. And it kind of like some of what they were talking about certain nerve bringing. And so I wanted to do some more research to understand, okay, what does this mean from a cybersecurity standpoint? And why aren't there many people talking about this in particular? And I'm going to dive deeper into this, but it's more so I want to talk about how much does a hack cost, not necessarily from a financial perspective, but more so from a perspective of the professionals who operate in this particular field. So, according to who? I'm going to start by actually pretty much defining what mental health means from World Health Organization, which I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with, specifically since COVID and everything has happened in the past few years. And so according to the World Health Organization, they define mental health as a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with life's stressful moments, to develop all their abilities, to be able to learn and work well, and to contribute to the betterment of their community. And when we think of that, especially from a perspective of burnout, it's not even specific to just cybersecurity, it's specific to multiple, across multiple industries and sectors of business. Um, they define burnout as a syndrome conceptualized as a result of chronic job stress that has not been successfully managed. Okay, so how does that translate into cybersecurity? Well, let's take a look at there's some statistics. 59% from a global perspective, not just in specifically in cybersecurity, say that they are challenged, their mental health has been challenged, um, where they don't feel as though they can operate in their jobs um, effectively, right? Their health is being affected by the thing, all types of different factors, from burnout, from being overworked, maybe the job of the company they work for is understaffed, and the other half, 41%, say that they're not challenged at all. Will of misfortune. So, taking those statistics from the 59%, I wanted to dive into a better understanding, okay, what are some of the reports and surveys that have been conducted to basically better analyze, okay, the situation in mental health of cybersecurity specifically? And so, 26% say that their mental health is excellent. 21% that is very good, and 20% rank their mental health as just good, 15% fair, 17% poor. I wanted to show some statistics starting off because when I go with diving deeper into this later on, it'll make more sense. So what does the stress look like? Stress level look like for them? Um, roughly half say it's either somewhat okay or fairly okay. Um, what, is, what does that mean from a perspective for the professionals working in this, in this particular space? Well, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, the engineers that I particularly work with, 
Some of them get into the mundane and routine task of doing the same things repetitive over and over and over. Um, if you're a penetration tester, let's say if external, internal, or physical, you land it. Um, most people who are interested in getting into this field as penetration pen testers, they, they're lured by the idea of, hey, I have possessed this skill set where I can break into things successfully, and I possess this skill set, therefore it's exciting. It's like an adrenaline, adrenaline rush. But oftentimes, whenever you're going on these engagements, participating in these engagements, what people don't speak of is, okay, how many times do you not successfully get in? How secure are these companies who are investing millions of dollars into better community organizations and their infrastructure to prevent those types of attacks from happening? Well, if you're a pen tester and you hit a brick wall after wall after wall, chances are you may even lose self-confidence in yourself to the point where it affects you mentally. So, besides the mental health, let's look dive deeper into, okay, what is the financial impact to organizations, right? Do, so, the average cost per data breach, just within the U.S. alone, it costs companies in the U.S. roughly $9.5 million per year based on data breaches. And you can see just from the bar chart, since 2006, that number has increased threefold. Um, the global average cost per data breach in the U.S. is $4.5 million per breach. So, if we look at it from a perspective, from a global perspective, we obviously see that the U.S. is a huge target in terms of cyber attacks. What is the financial loss? Well, the financial loss for cyber attacks in 2022, roughly a quarter of companies say that they spent anywhere between $50,000 to $100,000 per cyber attack. And if you add another quarter to that, then they're spending anywhere from between $100,000 to half a million dollars per cyber attack. What does that mean to the professionals operating in this space who have to respond to with incidents? If U.S. is such a huge target in this space when it comes to these cyber attacks that are happening, how does that affect the professionals mentally? If they're, if we're short staff, and I'll dive into that in my next slide. Now for on payroll. So since 2013, to 2023, there's been a 350 percent increase in the demand for cybersecurity professionals in the U.S. Okay, in 2023 alone, there were roughly 750,000 positions open that never got filled. That's about around 3.5 million jobs that don't get filled in an in-demand currently for cybersecurity professionals. Think about it from that perspective when we think about the U.S. being a huge target. They're pretty much more than half of the global average cost of cyber attacks that are happening. When the U.S. is the number one target and we're, there's also three and a half million jobs that can't get filled, what does that mean in order to meet the demand and fulfill the role in better securing um, these companies that need our help? Professional imposter. <laughs> so... I want to share a story. When I was first getting when I was first looking to get into cybersecurity, I wanted to get involved into the social engineering. I didn't even know cybersecurity was pretty much a, a thing or a career. But I was fascinated by a story Jason E. Street is telling about breaking into the wrong bank. Um, a friend of mine who's also a mentor to me out in Oklahoma City. He was given a presentation about social engineering, and I would ask him, say, what's some of the best advice that you could give me? And he shared with me, fake it till you make it. <laughs> Act like you belong. And oftentimes, a lot of sense, if you would look at it, just by looking at the numbers that I presented, right, it tells somewhat of a story. It tells a story about how there's so much happening, there's so many professionals being overworked, and they're being put in positions and roles where they may not even have all the information or have all the expertise to perform their job successfully or efficiently. And 
whenever my mentor first told me to share this advice with me, it didn't make sense to me at first. But now that I'm in the position that I'm in and I have some experience, it makes a lot more sense now, especially um, taking into consideration the numbers and the statistics that I just shared. So how many in the room, by show of hands, are currently enrolled in school or students? Quite a few. Okay. Have any of you actually had an internship or work? Okay, awesome. Um, let me paint a picture for you. Let's say, for instance, your internship. What? If you don't mind me asking, what was the internship for? What position? Uh, it was an A What is it? What, is, what does that mean specifically? Accuracy model. Okay, gotcha. So imagine this, right? You just got your CJ internship. It's your first day. And let's say, for instance, you're showing up to the office and you're preparing yourself mentally and you've been told, okay, you're going to operate as a security analyst or a SOC. That's the role that you're going to fill. And let's say, for instance, you got your backpack on, you, you're walking into the office and you start making your way to the SOC. It's like, okay, let me walk inside, see where I'm going to be set up, what duties or tasks I'm going to be assigned, and let's go from there. As soon as you walk into the SOC, right, your supervisor approaches you and says, hey, we just received a call from a university. They've been attacked by ransomware. They just shared with us that they received a ransomware note. We're going to send you out to respond to this incident with one of our engineers. How, how would that make you feel? I mean, fine, considering I'm a university student. Right? Okay. Well, how many, by show of hands, the students that raise their hands, how many of you would actually be excited? You would, you would? Nice. Okay. Let's take it a step further. Now, let's say, for instance, you, you got to say that you're in university. The same incident you're responding to, now you find out that this university they call is the university that you attend. How would that make you feel now? Probably a little more excited. A little more excited. <laughs> you got to, how, many about, how many of you actually shook up? Because, hey, maybe you don't possess the skill sets yet. Maybe it's your first time, and so you don't even know what to expect. It, it could go 50-50, right? So this is what I mean whenever I said the advice that I was shared by one of my mentors, fake it till you make it, <laughs> act like you belong, where it comes into play. Because chances are in this field, because there's so many professionals in high demand, we have to pretty much find the details, figure things out, and think critically in order to assist and help organizations or teams that don't possess the same skill sets that you do. Shut up and hack. <laughs> so, based on some of the, the numbers and statistics that I shared earlier, I wanted to dive into um, some information and share about what it would look like from an engineering perspective or pen tester. Um, based on conversations I've had with several engineers, if they operate in pen testing roles, they're doing some of the same tasks over and over. Whether it's an external pen test, some of them are just doing web app pen tests. It really just depends on what employer or organization you're working for. Smaller companies, you'll become more exposed to a lot more variety of engagements. Um, what does the leadership look like and how does that affect uh, an engineer's mindset and mentality? Um, if they're being overworked and their job or role is in high demand, then maybe that means that they are starting to lose self-confidence. It's just like what I was speaking about earlier um, in terms of doing more redundant tasks over and over, where if you're running into brick walls and you're not actually successful at gaining um, domain admin uh, on internal penetration tests, or getting the keys to the kingdom of every engagement like you would expect to, then chances are that could take a little toll and it'll cause you to lose self-confidence. And if you're work over work, maybe you don't have the time to actually continue your training. Maybe the leadership doesn't organize your tasks in a way to where you can actually effectively um, engage with your assignments to that. Digital forensics. How many of you guys are interested in digital forensics? I pray for you guys. <laughs> Seriously, I pray for you guys. In my honest opinion, I, I believe that it takes a special person and a special person of special character to be passionate about working in digital forensics. And a lot of this stems, a lot of this talk stems from the conversations I've had with forensic examiners and, and experts. Um, 
I believe that forensic experts, they serve a purpose because for the most part, they'll, the work that they do, it, um, it can save someone's life. And if they're, if you're operating with attorneys and on legal cases, the work that you do, whether good or bad, it, it justifies the livelihood of whomever is involved in a case, whether guilty or innocent. Um, my forensic expert that I worked with, he has had to examine quite a few dicks in his life, per se. There's a lot of a lot of big pictures that he has to go through. As a matter of fact, there was a call that was made where someone hired him specifically, hey, I believe my wife was cheating on me. I want you to examine and go through all these images and see. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is this. I've never seen a forensic expert actually publicly speak about the work that they do. And not only that, being good at their job can penalize them for the rest of their career, which is odd. So, the reason I say that is this. Some of the things that they see are traumatizing when it comes to child exploitation, when it comes to <laughs> murderous acts done to other people. Um, not only that, it goes as far as law enforcement who are involved with the digital evidence of these cases, mishandling that evidence and for a forensic expert to be good at their job and recognize that, if they speak out about that, then the next case that they're involved in, prosecutors will use that information against them. How does that truly affect the forensic experts knowing that in the back of their mind that, hey, if I speak publicly and express my opinions about the work that I do, law enforcement hears about it, and maybe I'm in, I get hired for the defense of someone who's actually guilty of child exploitation, how do I eliminate my bias? in this case and make sure that I effectively, effectively perform my job. Well, it just means that the data is the data. Making sure that the integrity of the data stays intact. That's what the forensic expert purpose and so sole role is in involved in this. So, to end, in, in this talk, I wanted to share some things, shed light on some things in terms of how we as security professionals can actually basically keep our sanity with all the work that we're involved in, especially when you demand it. And that is practicing mindfulness. Um, this past this past month, I actually took some time for myself to actually observe and participate for the month of Roma. Um, at my job, for instance, we actually do, we intentionally make time for each other in order to participate with our families, bringing our fa making sure our families are involved with the things that we do. As you can see some of the pictures where my engineers are with their children and we're just basically virtually meeting with each other and just having a drink together. Uh, we also enjoy going to conferences and speaking and educating a lot of other people about the, the cool things we do. Yes, it's a cool job, but at the same time, it also affects us mentally in terms of the man and also the things that we're seeing. Thank you. I want to share um, a comment on that slide you made about finding IT. I work in higher education. Okay. And um, you mentioned earlier that there have been a lot of jobs that arrive in cybersecurity, and you're 100% right. I do travel a lot. I don't care if Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago. When I meet with others in higher education, we are all trying to say, do you know someone in your area who can teach for us? We just can't find enough people um, to teach in cybersecurity programs. Now, I know you're in private. We're not actually going to leave you a big $200,000 job, but we need you to come in and bring your expertise to help prepare the next generation. We do not have enough people working or uh, I'm from Oklahoma City and we're right across, uh, not far from Tanker Air Force Base. And so we do get some people from there also uh, there who try to you know, teach with us, but there's a lot of colleges and universities and we are, so if you know people Please uh, go to LinkedIn and uh, 
tell them to apply because we are trying to, we're begging you to come. You know, so, I want to just beg you. you. In my talk, but does anyone have any questions by chance? Sure. I had to you back off of that comment. Okay. You know, there's always this conversation about, well, there's not enough cybersecurity talent and we have all these open jobs. And it's like, well, I'm definitely a firm believer that there's definitely enough talent. But it's getting them past HR filtering, automated filtering. Right. That says, well, you're not talent unless you fit this specific mold. Like myself, for example, I came from public security. I was part of the COVID relief two years ago, and now I work in cybersecurity. Right. But it took an immense amount of effort. I probably got rejected from 200 plus applications in my first year. My job, and I've heard nothing since then of the talk of, well, we just can't find enough people. And it's like, well, we can, but you have to start with the pitching the automated gate portion. I agree. Um, something that I find interesting is I've only been in cybersecurity for roughly two years, right? And I started in the internship position with the company that I work for. Something that I was intentional and adamant about was attending events like this and networking with people doing the jobs and performing the roles that I wanted to, to do, which is how I, I came across it which was actually doing social engineering. And so if I if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would have met many people in this industry or learned about any of the job opportunities. It's like again, LinkedIn is a tool. It's, some people may see it as a social media platform, but different than Facebook, IG, and so forth. But um, I use it as a tool because you can find those opportunities in specific regions, specific areas, and also do your own due diligence to study what skill sets people are looking for. Um, most of the job applications or job offerings, they list all the skill sets, certifications that you are interested that you need in order to fill that role. If you just study that and go through it and just say, hey, what is this about? Ask the question, what is this about? And learn those skill sets, chances are next time you apply for those jobs, you'll be at the, you'll be at the top list. Can I make a, just a point from this conversation? I don't have anything we need to add. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you want a job, just reach out to people on LinkedIn. I've had people message me, be like, hey, I see a position in your department open. I don't know this person. Right. They're like, I'm in college. Would you be willing to refer me? And once you get that referral, you're not going through that HR scanning system looking for specific keywords. Right. You're going directly to possibly an HR phone call if the position lines up with your experience. So that's like my recommendation for everybody in university right now. Uh, same thing. You know, I've been a hiring manager for 15 years, and almost everybody I hire is a, a recommendation. Mm -hmm. So this kind of stuff really makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, yeah, I've been in security for over 10 years, um, and there's two, two big camps. She she mentioned one of them where you, you, you have to apply for 200-plus positions, get it. And uh, the other camp is like they the, – the problem that I see is a lot of these companies, um, they just say they, they you need the cert certificates, you need five years' experience. Um, you need some networking background, you know. But I didn't take that approach when I when I I just hired somebody six months ago. Right. Um, in information security, you want to build them up. You want to bring them in um, when they don't. They have a passion, and not necessarily five certs. They might have one or two certs, and and some. And, and that's something that's difficult to gauge, especially if you're only looking at resume pieces. It's where that passion was. Um, what you can do for some of them, get into the system, and you may be able to testify with us is keywords at the top of your resume, you know, things like that. that it's a long time to go to pieces, get you uh, be hit, and, and it'll help with the system. Right. And if you want to be extra lazy, you use AI. You ask it to give you the top five skills that it's I know. used to be a STEM recruiter. And, uh, yeah. I, what about what she just said? Um, 
Yeah. We didn't use AI. I mean, we, we scanned them ourselves. But you are, you're correct. There's a box that would be checked as far as search. And that's just mainly to gauge someone's um, ability. Right. Like, can they get to where we need to be? In the interview, that's when we draw the actual skill in the woman situation. When you got a thousand rows in it and you're trying to filter. So, I have a question. Question, you know, the starting point, you did that, you started with the internship. I think, you know, finding internship is also very hard because um, I am in a cybersecurity and uh, it's because of my passion. I was a MBA student mm -hmm. and then I am entering into an IT field. But still, you know, I think it's very hard for me to find an internship because I don't have any experience in that field. So, what you do in that situation, you know, when you don't have experience but you have I a passion? You can actually reach out to the companies that do some of the work that you're interested in. <laughs> you can just ask to shout for a bank. Mm -hmm. that, like, that goes a long way. Oh, sorry, I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>